So I want you guys to leave this house. My jaw drops in disbelief as my mother-in-law smiles sweetly. My in-laws are trying to kick my husband and me out and help their beloved youngest son and his wife move in with them. This is a house that we worked hard to build. There's no way I can let go of it for such a ridiculous reason. As I clenched my fist in anger, suddenly a woman's voice interjected into the conversation. Oh, there's no need for that. I couldn't believe my ears. Why is she here? Let's go back a few months. I, Jane, had been discussing our dream home with my husband Wayne almost every day. A charming house with a garden and a picket fence, like one from a fairy tale. It had been my dream since I was little, and I had been envisioning it ever since we got married. We had been diligently saving money to build our ideal home, and our savings were more than enough for the budget. It was just the two of us, but eventually, we would have kids. I wanted to have some enchantments like a secret playroom throughout the house for them to enjoy. My daydreams were expanding. One day, my mother-in-law Anita called the home phone. Since Wayne was at work, I picked up the call. I heard the news, Jane. You are building your own house, right? She spoke as soon as I picked up the phone. I was a little taken aback. But I figured Wayne had told her and replied, Uh, yes. What kind of house are you planning to build? A cottage style sounds lovely. She guessed my ideal vision, and my excitement grew. We indulged in discussions about our dream homes for a while. It was unexpected, but it was delightful to have such an enjoyable conversation with her. Hooray for our dream home! I chanted in my mind. To be honest, I found her a bit difficult. I never thought she was a bad person, but it was just that she was quite stingy. For example, when I visited her before, we went out to do some grocery shopping. She loved to talk, so we had a decently enjoyable conversation on the way. Things started to take a strange turn when we arrived at the supermarket. As I put groceries into the cart while looking at my shopping list, she kept interrupting. Jane, instead of these expensive vegetables, why not go for the pre-cut ones over here? The meat you put in the cart earlier. The stuff just started putting half-price stickers on them, so I would go exchange it. The yogurt isn't on sale here. I think it's on sale at the other supermarket this month, so let's buy it there. It may be considered housewife wisdom, but it became tiresome to be checked and inspected every item I put in the cart. I didn't want to argue or be rude since she wasn't saying anything wrong, so I swallowed my complaints and followed her instructions. Afterward, while we were queuing up the cash register, she suddenly looked up from her phone and grabbed my arm with a sense of urgency. When I asked what was wrong, she told me that tissues and toilet paper were on sale at the pharmacy a few blocks away. She had received a message from a neighbor. I will go there first, so can you help me carry the bags when we go back? But we've already done a lot of shopping and got quite a few bags. Then go back home once and then come out again. I will wait for you. She then dashed out of the supermarket without hearing my reply. Dumbfounded, I gave in to her enthusiasm and did as she said. Sometime later, she finished her shopping and was waiting for me at the cafe in front of the pharmacy. The seats on either side of her were piled high with tissues and toilet paper a huge load to carry even across the street. In stark contrast, there was only one glass of water on the table. Surprisingly, she had only been drinking that while waiting for me. She told the waiter she would order something once I arrived. But it's okay now that you found me. Let's just leave. Aren't you going to order anything? When I asked in surprise, 
She laughed, saying that cafes were expensive. She had been waiting for me for at least 30 minutes. It seemed pretty rude to leave without ordering anything. I told her to order something, as I would pay. Without any hesitation, she took the menu and pondered for a while before finally calling the waiter. I will have a coffee, please, and... May I have an afternoon tea set? I looked at her in surprise, and she gave me a big grin in return. I've always wanted to try this. It's embarrassing for me to go to a cafe and eat it alone, you know? That wasn't the issue. Out of all things, she had to order the most expensive item in the cafe. If it were me, when someone treated me, I wouldn't have ordered anything more expensive than what the other person was having. If the other person only ordered a drink, wasn't it proper etiquette to also order just a drink? If she wanted to have a meal, she should have at least said something in advance, thinking that it would be embarrassing to protest in front of the waiter. I remained silent. In the end, even at the checkout, she cheerfully said her thanks, showing no sign of shame for what she had done. I later heard that she proudly showed the photos of her afternoon tea to the neighbors, bragging about it. That incident made me think she cares too much about appearances, but was stingy with money. I hope it's going to be a sturdy and beautiful house, Anita said on the phone. She hadn't brought up any money matters at that point. She probably didn't care, as long as it wasn't coming out of her pocket. Just as I was feeling a little relief, she suddenly made a proposal. Since you are already at it, let's make it a two-family house. What? I couldn't help, but I almost shrieked. She didn't seem to care about my reaction and continued babbling about the two-family house. It seemed like she had done some research beforehand. It was clear that she didn't just come up with the idea on a whim. Feeling uneasy, I said I would consult with Wayne and hung up before the conversation progressed. She kept repeating, it's definitely the best idea until the very end of the call. The following weeks were painful. Not only Anita, but even my father-in-law Steve started to intervene. They even burst into our house together. The main topic, of course, was about building a two-family house. Under their immense pressure, Wayne and I gave in and agreed with the condition that we split the cost. Once the new house was completed, we immediately started living together as a family of four. Although we called it a two-family house, the shared space was limited to the garage and the yard, and our living spaces were supposed to be separate. However, Anita quickly started to invade our privacy, and before I knew it, she often came to watch TV in our living room. Taking advantage of that, Steve placed his large belongings, like his golf bag, on our side without permission. Gradually, the two of them began to monopolize the entire house. No matter how many times I expressed my distress, they simply dismissed it with don't be so rigid. What bothered me the most was that they never paid their share of the promised construction costs. When I asked about the money, we were supposed to split. They claimed to have it ready, but showed no sign of actually paying. Wayne and I ended up taking out a loan and covering the cost ourselves. This Sunday, we are having a party with the neighbors, so you two don't bother us, okay? We were told something like that so often. Anita invited the neighbors over for a home party almost every week. They acted as if there was no agreement to split the cost and did whatever they pleased. One day, I came home when Anita was seeing off the party guest and overheard her saying this. We built this house, but it's too spacious for us. We let our son and his wife live here, but it's more enjoyable to have a lot of people over. It's our house, so feel free to come anytime. 
I couldn't believe my ears. How shameless she lied. She made it sound like they built the house and they were allowing us to live in it. Outraged, I immediately talked to Wayne about it. It seems he had reached his limit with his parents' arrogance as well, as he suggested setting up a proper place to talk. The next day, we courteously told Anita how we were being inconvenienced by the ongoing home parties. Our precious brand new home was being ruined. We wanted to resolve the situation amicably, but she gave no hoot about it. On the contrary, her overbearing behavior increased. She only engaged in activities like barbecues, which caused smoke to seep into the house. Not only that, but after the guests were gone, she just left everything in a mess. She made us do all the cleaning and tidying up. When Wayne and I were both mentally and physically exhausted, my in-laws came up with an idea to invite all the relatives. I asked if I could invite my parents. Then, Anita made a face as if she had bitten a bitter pill. No! We are already full house with our relatives. Your parents can come another time, okay? What did it mean that my parents weren't allowed to attend a family gathering? I felt suspicious and called my mom. Hi, Jane. What's going on? I was relieved to hear her voice, which I hadn't heard in a long time, and I told her everything. The refusal to let my parents attend the party and making Wayne and me pay for the entire cost of the new house. She listened and cheered me up by saying that I had done my best despite the hardships. I couldn't help but cry at her sweet words. Don't worry so much. Everyone is coming, right? It's a special party, so enjoy it. Encouraged by her, despite my anxieties, I gathered my determination. The house was built by Wayne and me. I swore to protect it together with him. On the day of the party, I welcomed the relatives, feeling nostalgic since our wedding. Among them were Wayne's younger brother, Isaac, and his wife. I had only spoken to them a little, but Wayne had told me several times that his parents doted on Isaac. As soon as he appeared, my in-laws became very cheerful. I couldn't help but feel a sense of dissatisfaction with the difference in their attitude toward us. At the same time, I thought if they were in such a good mood, we would spend the day without a hitch. I was a little relieved by the arrival of Isaac and his wife. However, that hope was quickly shattered. Isaac, how have you been? I've been worried since we haven't heard from you for a while. Anita was attacked to him throughout the party. Steve was watching them from the side. They left all the chores to me and Wayne and didn't even bother to move from their seats. And then, Anita suggested something outrageous. You know, why don't you move in with us? We've been discussing it. We'll transfer the ownership of this house to you, so there will be no problem. They were talking casually and seems to be oblivious to what they were really saying. The relatives didn't seem surprised by their statements, as if they believed that the house belonged to my in-laws. Instead, they irresponsibly agreed, saying it was a great idea. Wait a minute! I couldn't bear it any longer, and interrupted them. The house was for two families. There were no vacant rooms. It was impossible for all of us to live together. In response to my outburst, Anita opened her mouth with a look of annoyance. So I want you guys to leave. I was speechless, and Wayne stepped forward to take my place. He argued that we had taken out all the loans ourselves and built the two-family house at their demand. We've fulfilled your wishes, but you've done nothing for us. On top of that, you are telling us to leave? How dare you guys? It was rare for him to speak so directly, but I felt exactly the same way as him. I nodded in agreement several times beside him, 
If this house belongs to you guys, then it's practically ours too. What's wrong with us living here? You must have a lot of money to be able to build such a big house. So why don't you just build another one? You're older, so give it to your younger brother. It's not that simple. Wayne was also exasperated with a strained expression in the sigh. The relatives who had been watching the exchange between us, perhaps sensing that we were being overwhelmed, began to make statements in support of my in-laws. Isaac and his wife, on the other hand, remained silent, seemingly avoiding any involvement. Occasionally, they exchanged troubled looks and giggled. If things had continued as they did, we would have ended up giving up our house, just like when we were pressured last time. I absolutely couldn't allow them to take our home in that way. No matter what we said, we were overwhelmed by the numbers. We were at the loss. You don't need to give the house up. I couldn't believe my ears when a woman's voice suddenly joined the conversation. I was confused about why she was there. When I turned around, my mom and dad were standing at the entrance to the room. To the astonishment of everyone, the two of them nodded instead of greeting them. Then, my mom walked towards me and smiled, saying, Surprise! I could feel my tears coming up from the relief and bit my lip as I nodded. They must have been worried after the call, so they came all the way. I finally understood what my mom meant by not worrying. It seems like everyone here doesn't know, but the ownership of this land belongs to my husband. This house is also ours. We don't want it transferred to someone without our consent. My mom declared with a resolution. Including my in-laws, the relatives looked surprised. It was a shock to those who weren't present at the contract signing. In the midst of the commotion among the relatives, my in-laws anxiously began shouting, claiming it was all a baseless lie. My dad approached them and shut them up in a low rumbling voice. It can be easily proven by the registry. I suggest you refrain from making unfounded claims. Blood drained from the in-laws' faces. They must have been freaking out inside. The relatives who had been observing were giving them disdained looks. I knew it was a lie. I was spectacle from the beginning. A well-known local figure is saying so. The whispers were coming not only from inside the room, but also from the hallway. I looked in that direction in puzzlement. There, neighbors were watching us. I assumed my parents had chosen them as witnesses. As a relative said, my dad was a well-known figure in the town and led a Bible study for adults and kids in the local church. My mom also knew many people through her volunteer activities, so she was trusted by the people around her. Their statements turned the table on us, and my in-laws were unable to make any excuses and fell silent. Thus, the party ended in our favor. A few days later, my in-laws, who were shamed in front of all the relatives and neighbors, tried to patch things up but failed miserably. In the end, they fled the house with their tails between their legs a few days later. My parents didn't just let them leave, but they also demanded a large cleaning fee, adding insult to injury. They said it was a punishment for being carried away in our new home, but it was probably done for our sake. I can't thank my parents enough. I recently heard that my in-laws are now living with Isaac and his wife. They rent a small apartment, much smaller than my house. It must be very tight for poor people to live there. After having their way all this time, I hope they will live modestly without causing Isaac trouble. In reality, I hear they are constantly arguing due to the stress of repayment. Wayne and I invited my parents to live in our immaculately clean house, and now we live a peaceful two-family life. Both of them are overjoyed to be able to live next to us. There is no benefit in showing off. 
I swear in my heart that from now on, I will live to share happiness with the people I care most about.